Thanks. Um, I'm Lalisa Duguma presenting the work that is done by quite a number of people that you see on the screen, and it is specifically about ecosystem-based adaptation as a nature-based solution to climate change and variability. Because this is more about a practical insight, I'll be really delving into um, most of the on-ground issues. Uh, next, please. So very often when we hear about ecosystem-based adaptation, we are taken quickly to the agenda of climate change, but it is a combination of factors that drive the whole vulnerability of communities. And the need for ecosystem-based adaptation is basically driven from two angles. The ecosystem needs to be sustainable in a way it has to produce ecosystem goods and services, and the communities that depend on this ecosystem also need to drive livelihood benefits. They need to manage the ecosystem and become more resilient. And they have to build their adaptive capacity depending on these ecosystems. So there are two critical things here, the climatic stressors and the non-climatic stressors. Very often what is happening is actually the climate change and variability impacts are amplified by the effects of the non-climatic stressors. So in EBA, we're very briefly, what we are looking at is how do we build the both sides of the coin, that the ecosystem and the community. It is not either or, it is both. And for this to be achieved, there is a strong need for building local capacity for communities, for stakeholders, and at the same time instilling the governor, good governance principles in the ecosystem so that that holistic resilience could be achieved. Next. So just to give you an overview of this case study where we are emphasizing on, it's being done in the Gambia where we have quite a large degradation of ecosystem in the country. Uh, according to one study, actually, they state that the country has lost almost all its primary forest. And in this country, what we are focusing on is trying to rebuild the natural capital so that people who depend on these ecosystems or natural resources can actually be more resilient. We are working with 53 community forests, seven community protected areas, and over 250 individual farmers including the schools. That just to give you an overview of the degradation extent that is happening in the country, you see the one part of the country that we have tried to analyze the land cover change and the forest has gone down by 50% in 20 years, shrublands have gone down by 17 and riverine vegetations by 22%. What is this telling us? Land covers that provide multifunctional goods and services or benefits to the communities are actually disappearing. So we need action. Next. So in EBA planning, the most important part or even the beginning of the whole process should be understanding the stressors. As I mentioned before, we have two streams of stressors, the climatic stressors, because this is about adaptation, and then the non-climatic stressors. And we are trying to respond to all of these in the work that we are doing in the Gambia. If you look carefully at the climate stressors part here, we looked at the temperature and the moisture index aspects. And the temperature is a very important one because it is changing drastically. And this is the projection to 2050. And the red points are actually indicating where we are today. In 2050 are the blue points. These are projections done by one of our scientists, Roland King. And when we come to the non-climatic stressors, we have so many factors at play. Next. And also when we work in landscapes or ecosystems, it's not just about the very common stressors that we know of. There are also emerging stressors. For instance, in the Gambia, when there is a sea level rise during some seasonal events, the seawater actually pushes into the inland parts of the country. And this is resulting in changing vegetation forms in some parts of the country. What is that change? Acacias, which are more tolerant to the salinity level of the water, are becoming more aggressive in invading lands. Where they invade, there are tiny grasses which are replacing the grasses which are most suitable for cattle. 
So what do these people depending on cattle do? Should they replace cattle with goats and sheep or should they migrate? Next. From a broader perspective, just to give you a sense of how we are approaching the whole issue, we are doing participatory ecosystem-based adaptation planning, which is more looking into the community forest areas, the community protected areas, which are biodiversity conservation spots managed by people or communities, degraded agricultural lands, fire management, water management, including business development and all those things. Here, what you see on this map is the one that we have done for one single community out of the 53. Why are we concerned about bringing people on board? It is about people. It is about the ecosystem. It is not either or, it is about both. And what we are doing is we are producing these professional maps that will guide intervention implementation. The maps will be validated by communities and they will put it into action. Next. Three minutes left. Well, thank you, sir. So when we look at what should be happening on the ground, it's about intervention choice. Intervention choice is about negotiation because there are different factors that affect that negotiation process. Very often we mention about gender because there is male, female issues. There is also their various social classes which affect what we basically can choose as the most suitable accommodative practice that will be taken on board. Here you see the graphs that we've developed based on the data we've collected. There are some activities highly preferred by men but not by women and the vice versa also is there. So it is about negotiation, it's about inclusivity, it's about onboarding everyone so that we have a compromised or a negotiated intervention. Second, local ecological knowledge is very important and this is what we are really building on. For instance, in the Gambia, one of the key things is the fire intensity issues, wild wind direction, where is it coming from? How is it the spread of the fire? They know all of these things. They need support to implement what needs to be done to help them adapt. Second, in the local ecological knowledge aspect, they are helping us to know where wild links for transplanting are. This is what we call enriching forests with forests. Where you don't have a nursery, this is what you depend on. You get local species that will be transplanted to enrich the forests to provide the ecosystem goods and services. Next. So in as only, much only one minute, so you better conclude. Yes, in as much as local knowledge is important, knowledge about the future or based on projections, what species, what intervention could actually be suitable in the future is also critical. Here you see habitat suitability projections done for two species. And the reason why we focus on this is because it is about today in as much as it is about tomorrow. Last one. Next, please. Yeah, local capacity development is really fundamental because projects will end. When the projects end, people need to continue doing what they are doing to adapt to the changes that are coming up. So it is important we build a local capacity for institutions, for households, for individuals, so that they keep on doing what they are doing. Overall, this work has taught us a lot of lessons that we are building on in other projects to make an EBA planning more effective, inclusive, and efficient. Thank you so much.